And I believe it depends on the reason you're there, the reason for the speech. So if this speech is about motivation, if it's to get the energy up, then fine, no, shot, no tchotchkes. If it is content heavy and it's important to get a lot of information out, the mistake people make is that they try to shove too much. Well, having informational handouts allows you to move some of that detail off of your presentation. So your presentation now has a lot more space that works better and they still get the information. And then I go one step further. Sometimes I don't want them to have the handout in their hand right then because if it is information uh, heavy, it may actually distract them. So I often will have my presentation. I'll have some handouts for them at that time that are um, less dense. And then I'll say, you know, if you want more, on my website, I'll give them the link, et cetera, and I'll say, I have the full 21-page report. Now they're not distracted by it, but they have access to it. So number one, don't always do it. You, Q&A is a choice, right? So it gets back to what's the purpose of this presentation. Now, if it is a content-oriented one and you aren't going to build in Q&A time, again, you want some way for them to reach you. So whether that's giving the email, et cetera, some way for them to follow up. If you are going to do Q&A time, then you do have to recognize it's one of your elements, right? So it's not beginning or opening and three points and then closing. It's opening two points, maybe Q&A there and then another one, or three Q&A, or maybe it's just two points and Q&A. So you really have to, number one, um, plan for that. I never close with Q&A. I think it's deadly. It would be one of the deadly sins. Um, because you can't control the energy at the end if it was somebody else's question. So when I am going to offer Q&A, I always have a closing anyway. And that closing is, that my opening and closings, those are down pat. There's, there's no wiggle room in it. I've decided what it's going to be, and it's going to be that. Um, so your timing, again, has to recognize that I need to wrap Q&A up with three minutes left or five minutes left or whatever it is that that closing is going to take. That way you get to close in the way that you want to and you control the energy. The, another thing that can go wrong is you open up the plate Q&A and no one asks something. So if I'm going to open the Q&A, I will see the question in the audience. I will actually say to somebody in the audience, you know, I'm going to open up for Q&A. This is always a really good opener question. So if you notice no one's asking, because usually once there's one question, people will pop. But, um, and then if for any reason that's not a strategy that will work, another strategy is to simply be ready with, you know, uh, we got time for Q&A. Oh, I see nobody's thought of one yet, but let me tell you a question I often get. And then you essentially ask your own question, which comes from something somebody's actually asked. So it can be tricky. It's okay, I think, to leave it off. It depends on the purpose of the speech. But if you're gonna do it, you don't want it to be really at the end. I do try not to leave things a chance knowing that things will always go wrong. Um, so um, I want to control what I can and I want to be prepared with specific strategies for the things that can go wrong. And those things are the timing goes wonky or, you know, the person before you tells this horrific story that makes everybody depressed. Um, or, you know, there really has been a, a, a death amongst the group or there's something that just take, the energy is just not where you thought it would be and you've got to recover. Example, I had a full day training the day after 9-11. Everybody in the room had been up all night watching the television. People were upset. You could tell. And yet they had, somebody clearly, I could tell, somebody had talked to them and said, listen, we brought her in. We're paying this for two days. So you need to just put all this aside and really give it your best attention. So ask me not to mention it. So I started and started my own regular sort of opening, which of course was totally inappropriate, it's funny and all this stuff, you know. And, and finally I just did a timeout. I said, there's an elephant in the room, let's deal with that. And I said just a few things, acknowledged the problem, and then said, you know, but perhaps our best response to this is to do what we do well. And so I'm going to be here to help you do this piece. And then I actually told him, I said, and I know this might be a stretch for some of you. And so I'm going to just, any of you that need to take a free refresher with me at any other time, just know that's going to be an option for you. 
And that was enough to take it off the table and come back and do what we needed to do. So I think a speaker needs to be able to call the elephant in the room and take a quick time out if necessary and, and deal with it and then come back in. I was doing a training for a bank, which is what I do. Um, I get to the venue and I've been trying to call the chief lending officer for weeks because that's one of the things I usually do, interview, what's your issues, you know, so that I do feel comfortable that I know something's going in. This guy wouldn't return my phone calls, his assistant kept talking to me and I kept thinking, gosh, this is just weird. I get there and he wasn't friendly at all. And then his assistant said, I said, so let me make sure you have another copy of my introduction. She says, oh, we won't be using that one. I said, really? She says, well, he thought it was too frivolous, so he'll, he'll do something different. And I'm known for funny, and my introduction has funny things in it, but no. So I immediately I'm thinking, okay, something's really gone wrong. Then I look at this group. The tension in the room was palpable. I didn't know what was wrong, but I absolutely knew something was. I started with my usual opening, and it was just dying. It was like, you know. So here's what I did. In any audience, even when things aren't going really well, often you'll make a connection with just one or two people, right? Some, somebody will smile or they'll seem uh, that they're interested or they'll nod their head or something. So uh, way earlier than I would ever normally take a break, I had identified about two people that I sort of got connected to. I took an early break. They did not know it was early because remember, I don't tell people what's wrong, right? Or, so I said, you know, y'all had a lot of coffee this morning, so let's go ahead and take, I always like to take the bre first break real early. They don't know that's not true. And then as soon as we broke, I went right for the people that I had connected with. And I said, please tell me what's going on. Turns out that everybody in the room had had their lending authority cut in half. They didn't even know why they were at this training because they can't use it. And the person who was gonna lord it over them was someone they didn't like and she was in the room. So, very different circumstance, right? Now, I happen to have the ability, remember I plan, and I have a, a depth of experience that really helps to, have this, have, to know you will always have way more information than anybody in the room needs. I have the ability to speak to that group too, you know, a group that doesn't have their own lending authority but needs to advocate for other customers, so I just shifted right away. I came back in, I said, you know, I just heard that you have had some changes in who has what lending authority. And so let me tell you why, even if your lending authority is less, this is gonna help you, it's gonna help you in your career, and it's gonna help you advocate for your customers. I basically gave them the pitch, and while it certainly couldn't re reverse immediately the toxicity in that room, it started to. It happened that I was doing another training for the same bank, a different group, two days later. That one I started right from the beginning, knowing what my situation was and was able to handle I also, by the way, was furious with my client, and I absolutely had to manage that because at the time that I was still presenting, that was not going to serve me. It was certainly not going to serve the people in the room. So there are times when, as a speaker, something's happened that you simply just have to manage your own emotions, decide what's... Because the moment you're in front of this audience, it is so not about you anymore. It is absolutely about what do they need how can I help them get it? And if you're focused on how you feel or how angry you are or wh what are they thinking, or it, it's totally not only wasted energy, but it actually can get in the way of the only reason you're in front of the room, which is to help the audience get what they need. I, uh, I don't do a lot of like, the kind of writing I do tends to be more in the technical arena related to tax return analysis. I do blogs. Um, I do blogs for myself and also for my professional association, the National Speakers Association. So I definitely do write, um, but, but I'm not a prolific writer like a lot of people in my field are. They're exactly the same from the standpoint that you need to understand the results you're trying to get for whoever is receiving the information. So in a speech to your audience, in a written form, it's the person. So it tends to be written form, tends to be a person. Audience tends to be bigger group. But you know, even when I'm in front of an audience or if I'm doing my own video for, for my work, I always have a one person in mind anyway. I'm really not talking to the 30 out there. I'm talking to you and I'm talking to you and I'm talking to you. 
um, because it's not what the 30 people are going to do. It's about each of the individuals, what they're going to do with the information, motivation that I can provide that will make the difference. I, I agree. Uh, in the training that I do, I train lenders on tax return analysis. It could be a dry subject, but not with me. Um, in fact, I'm a CPA, and my clients have decided that the P in CPA stands for playful. So I'm a certified playful accountant. Um, but um, every person in that room, first of all, I'm fortunate in that. Every person in that room actually wants to be there. It's not that they want tax return analysis training, but they want the ability to um, excel in their careers. Everyone in the room does. Everyone in the room wants to better serve their customers, or in the case of credit unions, their members. Everybody does. Um, and frankly, everybody, um, or certainly most people, would like to know that their uh, work does contribute to the um, profits or the health of the organization that hires them. So um, every single person can really benefit if I can package what I know that, first of all, get rid of all the stuff that I know that they don't need to know, right? So in case of tax return analysis, dump a bunch of it, find the part they need, figure out how each one of them can best learn it, and then package it for each one. And some of them it's going to be stories, and some of it's going to, the rest of it's going to be blurry until I can get them on paper and have them work in it. And others, um, it's going to be um, a specific example. Um, so everybody learns differently, and everybody hears things differently. And that's one of the things I do think that as a speaker, um, at one point you and I talked about what do you do to prepare, and my first thought is what do they need? And then how do I get that for them? And because there's more than one person in the room, what this person needs might be a little different than that one or that one. So having different techniques, some people love handouts, and they really do need them. And other people are not even going to look at the handout, and they're just going to listen. Uh, some are going to listen to take notes, and others taking notes would be in their way. So developing tools allow you to actually connect with each of the different people in whatever way would best work for them and still stay within your time frame and, and meet the objectives. That's what a good speech writer is and what a person who can deliver well is. Well, you know, there's impromptu speaking and then there's impromptu speaking. <laughs> Sometimes the, what you're doing right then is impromptu, but the topic is one you actually knew is likely to come up. And then sometimes it's just like you had no idea what the topic would be. Um, for someone who knows that even though they don't know when or for how long these things, these opportunities will arise, but they know that this is a topic area that could arise, I really recommend that they almost think in terms of sound bites, like you would if you were interviewing with a news organization. If you've thought it through in terms of sound bites or specific points that are important, then when the opportunity arises, you don't ramble all over the place and then later try to figure out what the heck did I do, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't have a plan, then it's really too easy to meander off. So um, if it's truly impromptu, the other advice I have is to pause. It's perfectly okay at the beginning to say, let me, let me think about that. Oh, okay, you know, that's, that's totally legit. And I, I, by the way, never been in Toastmasters, so I don't know if they would ding you for doing that, but I think that if your purpose is to communicate well, that pausing to gather your thoughts is a brilliant move. Well, a couple things. Number one is I rarely see any position in the business world where there's not some public speaking involved. Now, this could be just you presenting to your team of eight people. Um, it could be you being called to present then that group's ideas to management or something else. So while I do get paid to present, um, the skills that you develop as in public speaking, absolutely, it's one of those things that just crosses all boundaries. So I believe that improving your ability to speak on your feet improving your understanding of how you can structure a presentation and have it be more effective uh, actually will stand you in good stead no matter I remember the first thing I did in public speaking was as a volunteer for a local organization I didn't 
you know, so even people that think, oh, but I'm not going to be in business. Well, are you going to be alive? <laughs> you know, are you going to be in the PTA at some point? Are you going to be a volunteer for your local church or community organization? You're going to need to do some public speaking. So as far as getting over the fear, fact is that even professional speakers sometimes get the jitters. I happen to have a presentation on I'm doing this a week from today and just found out my co-presenter can't attend. We had crafted a presentation. His half of it is something I don't speak on. I have no ability to cover. Now that's not true because I'm going to figure out how to do it. But um, So one week out, I'm sitting here without my co-presenter and I'm scrambling actually as soon as I get back to my office this afternoon to figure out, can I get it, somebody to substitute for him? Can I get his information and get enough information from him to present it anyway? Um, is it way out of my league or is it something that once I hear what it is, I actually do know more than I think I do about it? Um, or can I shift all together and uh, sort of dump his stuff, take it in hand out for him so, it, so we're still keeping our promise to the audience? Because this is a promoted program. It's part of a, a convention. And it's already, the description is out there. You know, people are already picking what they want to come to. So I, I've got to deliver on that. I've got to deliver on that. But I personally can't deliver on that. So can I get his handouts, which are just in a rough form, of, as I understand it right now. They were actually due on Monday. So I'm behind deadline. I've lost my presenter. I don't actually know how I'm going to pull it off, but I know it will be good because I am a professional speaker, and so I can do this. Um, but having all the public speaking tools at my disposal so that that's not my concern, I don't need to figure out how to craft a story for this. I don't need to, there's a lot I don't need to worry about because I know, have those tools so I can worry about the part that actually needs my attention right now so that the audience that comes gets what they need to. So um, I may, in the next five days, interview probably 10 to 20 um, regulators and auditors and shift the part on his topic from the depth that he would have presented to here's what examiners and auditors are saying right now on this topic. I think it'll be extremely valuable to the group. I don't think anybody's going to walk out of the room and go, I don't think she covered bullet point three because it will be covered. It just is not going to happen the way it would have if Roger and I had both been there. Um, but so that's a scramble that, you know, things go wrong. So do you think I'm going to be a little bit nervous I and mean, we started this with how do you get nervous I will be nervous on that one let me tell you how I'm going to fix it when I uh, on the somewhat rare occasions now but on the occasions when I am nervous I always get there early and I talk to people who are going to be in the room it's amazing how once you've talked to somebody and say oh why are you here and they start telling you their story and then you talk to somebody else now you have a personal connection with people number one Number two, you have validated that they are there because they care about what you're planning to share. And um, I just did something you should not do, and that is to say number one, two, and three when you don't have the third one. I had the third one, and it did go away. And what I'm doing right now is exactly what I do in a speech. And people laugh because everybody's forgotten things. I mean, that's the thing. Well, there are times when thing people won't laugh at you or with you. Um, but actually, everybody in the room, most people in the audience, except in those political situations or whatever, they want you to succeed. They really do. They'll give you a whole bunch of latitude because they are probably also people who are a little bit nervous about speaking. And frankly, the reason they're there most of the time is because there's something that you have to share that they actually do want to know. I've seen really good speeches that were completely read top to bottom. But it was someone who was not a professional speaker who had content that was clearly of great interest to the people in the room, who felt that the best way to be sure he got it right was to read it, mm -hmm. but it didn't come across. I mean, normally you would say, don't read your whole speech. Mm -hmm. This guy did, and it was well received. Mm -hmm. So the audience will cut you a lot of slack mm -hmm. if they are interested in your topic and you clearly thought through how can you best share the information with them. It is. You plan as best you can, and then you're completely ready to go off plan. I think of it as an accordion. And if you think of an accordion, number one, it can get smaller or bigger. So if somebody tells you that your 45 minutes has just been cut to 20, you can do that. But also accordion does this, right? The handheld ones anyway. Um, so uh, if you stay audience focused, though, I mean, that's such a key. 
it, it, you got to go from 45 to 20. Okay, quit stressing about yourself and how the heck am I going to do this and think, okay, in the 20 minutes I have with them, what would be best to do for them? And then having some tricks. There are definitely tricks to it. Um, the, one of the tricks is you plan to do five points. There are five points on your handouts. It's clear that there are five points. Well, you don't say, I never apologize. You do not say, gosh, I'm sorry, I only have time for two. The wording is, you know what? I had five points. I definitely want to give you information on all of them, which is why it's in detail in your handout. For today, let's talk about two of them, the two most important, or the two first, or whatever. Now, they don't feel like they've missed anything. In fact, they feel like you gave them a gift by putting the rest of them in. And you can see how that would be so different than starting out saying, you know, I'm sorry, I'm out of time, and we're not going to make it, la, la, la. That's why also I don't use handouts that are fill in the blank. Because the fill in the blank handouts, if you run out of time, it's obvious you ran out of time because you were supposed to fill in the blanks. And people, no matter how good you were, the minute they know that you've left something out, then they get upset about it. If they never knew you planned it, what you did was perfectly fine. But if they realize you only got to point two and you planned to get to five, then they've somehow been cheated. So yes, they will go wrong. Um, it's hard on anyone no matter how long you've been in this game, to read negative feedback, and it doesn't matter that it's only one of 50, e your brain is just going to go right to it. And what I think you need to realize, first of all, is did I take care of the most of the group? A, and B, whoever brought you in, did you meet their objective? And then for the one person for whom it went wrong, we don't know if they just got diagnosed with cancer. We don't know if this is the anniversary of their parents' dad. I mean, you just don't know what might have happened with them. So even though it's hard to um, sort of let that go, you, if you won't stay in speaking very long if you are not able to. The other thing is remember about the style. So I had one that I remember it even now. And she just, it was one of my trainings. And she says, you know, if you left out of the stories, we could have been here, been gone, you know, been done in half the time. Well, I happen to know that for most people, the stories are critical because the stories are what lets their brain relax and be ready to take in more. And in my case, most often they also illustrate some important point. I acknowledge that in the universe, there are some people for whom stories would waste their time. So in some ways, she was just expressing her personal preference. I acknowledge that, but then I decide overall it was still a good idea now sometimes someone will say something to me and I'll say you know there's some validity in that before you get defensive you need to stop and say was I just too much into my stories that day you know did they go a little too long so it could be that this person is saying something that the others are just aren't willing to say yes and you come to classes like yours you join Toastmasters I mean there are definitely skills that absolutely can be learned so you will accelerate that learning dramatically when you get help. People are not, there are very few people who are natural speakers. And those who are could be 10 times better if they got some of the ideas about how to structure and how to decide and, and you know all the things that you would cover in your course and that they get in Toastmasters. And if they're wanting to be paid to speak, that they would get in the National Speakers Association. Uh, so. I've been in this business for 35 years. I am still getting good ideas to get better. Nobody's done. If they're done, they're probably buried. There are some um, aspects of giving a speech that I think can really get in somebody's way and can really reduce the impact of the speech. So we start with the idea again that the first step in assessing your speech is what impact do we need? What result do we need for the audience? And that's step one. If you don't have that in mind, you shouldn't be planning your speech yet. So you really have to get that in order. The things that I think will really get in, uh, in the way of a good speech, one of them is apologizing for anything if the audience doesn't already know there's a problem. So um, if you've spilled something down your shirt and it's red and your shirt is white, you're probably going to have to say something about it. If your shirt is red and they can't tell, let it go. Um, I remember I was in a car accident um, on the way to a speech. And I actually, high-speed collision, broke my nose, had to not do that speech. But the very next one was, I don't know, three weeks later. 
and I'd recovered enough that nobody could tell, right? But it was the first speech after a pretty scary accident. So I was not on my game. And I knew it, but I knew I could do a good job, right? So I could have had the introduction be something like, you know, first speech back after her accident. We're so glad she was able to come because we really weren't sure she could. So, you know, really give her a round of applause that she'd even show up. Everybody would be worried now about the accident. It would take us completely off our game. Well, it happened the speech was to the National Speakers Association about roadblocks in speaking. Uh -huh. So I did the introduction I would normally do. I actually got started on it. And then I went off to the side of the stage to do a little time out. I said, let me tell you what actually happened. And then I told them about the accident, uh -huh. right? Because if they had known and didn't need to know, mm -hmm. then it would be in the way. Now, this particular group, because of the topic, it turned out it was good for them to know. Mm -hmm because we were able to talk about how do you work around some of those things. Mm. But I still didn't open with it. I didn't want them to be concerned or worried. Now, if you show up and you're in crutches, you have to deal with it right away. Mm. So at one point I had um, blown out my back. I actually initially couldn't walk. Mm. And then for the first, oh, probably five or six presentations, I either was on crutches or I had a crutch with me. Um, well, you can't walk in on crutches and not say something. Um, or you can't have a crutch ready just in case, you know. <laughs> so for those groups, I would you know, say, hey, by the way, I got a crutch because I blew out my back, but I'm doing really well. And I promise to tell you if I take pain meds because the program gets a little different when I take drugs. And they all laugh, and it is funny, but now this is taken care of. They don't have to worry about the crutch, and they don't wor have to worry about me. So um, I don't um, apologize. If I am behind on time, I don't even tell them. They don't know. The audience will never know there's a problem if I can keep it from them. They just won't because that gets in the way. That means I have to manage my emotions around that problem in any way, and the focus is always audience-centered at that point. So you really, once you are in the room or anywhere in the environment, you're, you leave your ego at the door, you leave your personal problems at the door, unless it's a crutch and then you got to tell them right um, you get very audience focused and what happens then is that when things go wrong if you already have decided to be and are really in that audience focused space then when things go wrong the first thing you think of is how does this affect the audience and do I need to do anything about it if it's a fire alarm going off obviously you do um, if it is somebody in the next room that's dropping something if it's once you don't if it keeps happening, you make a joke out of it, and then you say, let's take a quick break, and you go ask the people in the other room to keep it down. I went to training for bankers in the evening next door to a Toastmasters. Now, the Toastmasters, every, what is it, four minutes or eight minutes, they're all applauding and so forth. And so I, after the third one, you know, it was clear it was going to be a little disruptive. So I said, you know what, I think that they should know that we're having fun too. So every time they applaud, we're going to stop and applaud too. So we started hooting and hollering. They had a blast. It was funny. And it just basically turned something that would have been bothering everybody into, you know, something that was manageable. So, but if you're audience focused, you can see. You can see people in the back that they can't hear or they can't see or there's something going on or they're getting too hot. Another interesting thing about public speaking, I think, at least the way that I do it in longer time frames, is that your brain is like it's bifurcated. I guess that would only be two spaces. There's, there's like 10 things going on. Because A, you're having to focus on the content and the way you deliver it, key. B, you're monitoring the audience the whole time. C, you're paying attention to the time. D, you're thinking, is the warm room too warm? You know, E, you're going, did they say they were gonna bring lunch in at noon or am I supposed to, you know, I mean, your, your brain is just, it's just segmented. And you're having to follow all of that while the audience thinks you're only paying attention to them. Yeah. They will never know all the variables, and they don't need to know. They absolutely don't need to know. All they need to do is get what they need. And all you need to do, really, is give them what they need. Okay, so I'll give you a, excuse me, <laughs> sometimes it is that severe. Um, especially if you have, uh, you're dealing with an illness yourself. Especially if it's one that just came on. Right? Yeah. So you started the day and you were fine, and you start to realize, okay, food poisoning, you know, what is this, right? 
Um, I actually have had a couple of times where, and in 35 years, so you know, I've got a lot of years to do this in, but probably two or three times where I literally became ill and I'm trying to figure out, do I tell them? Certainly I don't want to get them ill, so if I don't know, is it food poison or what, you know, I start modifying how close I am to them because I do tax return training. I come around while people are working on case studies and help them. Um, so back to the do they need to know thing. If I don't feel well but it's not contagious um, and they don't know, they will never know. I will not tell them. If it potentially can be contagious, like it, and it just came down that morning and I'm, you know, um, I'll, I'll do, you know, the old, hi, not shaking hands today, might have a cold, right? Uh, there was one time when I became ill, I, I, I think it was food poisoning, I got like deathly ill. And at lunch, when they were gone to lunch, I actually laid down underneath the table to figure out, okay, can I get better enough? What is it? How bad is it? Because this is the two-day training, right? And um, got one of the banquet staff brought me some seven up, you know, and I'm just trying to troubleshoot. Am I even able to overcome this? Um, and in that case, I'm pretty sure I wasn't. So when they came back from lunch, I just had to say, you know, guys, I don't know what's going on, but I've become extremely ill and I'm not able to continue with you today. And in this case, it was my own training as opposed to brought in by somebody else. So I could just say, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to leave for the day. I'm going to get back out to you on what dates would be work for you. I had to pay for the hotel, there was a lot of cost involved. Um, but I didn't tell them I was, you know, something was wrong until I had figured out that I could not fix it. Um, so it can happen. It helps to know ahead of time what your plan, so you go back to planning, right? Things go wrong. I carry with me, gosh, I've got Imodium AD, I've got Tylenol, I've got Ibuprofen. I actually have narcotics now because if my back does go, it's it's extreme pain. My doctor wants me to travel with, you know, the Vicodin. I don't use it, but boy, I have it because if I'm traveling and I'm in Tampa and, and I herniate a disc, I will need some Vicodin, you know, to get back. Um, I, have, uh, I have other um, drugs. I have all kinds of things that if something went wrong that could short-term be fixed with something, I've got the short, oh, I've got throat coat tea with me you know, in case my throat is sore. Um, so I plan for things to go wrong. I, I plan to capsize is my sea kayaking phrase for that. I absolutely plan for things to go wrong. And if you're a sea kayaker you are, and you've gotten trained, you can self-rescue, you can rescue others, you can participate in your own rescue, you can assess that the wind has come up and what's that going to do and should I change course. Truly, you do all those things as a speaker. You've got all your tools all your tricks, all the things that you've learned so that you can stay focused on the audience and they won't even know something's going wrong. And then when it really goes wrong enough, then you decide, how do I tell them? What do I tell them? And can I still get them what they need given the circumstances we have now? If some of your students are in fact thinking about professional speaking, there's a couple avenues towards that. Often professional speakers actually have a, like a first career or maybe a big experience. They climb Mount Everest on, you know, one leg or some, you know, something unusual has happened to them. Um, some go right into public speaking, but often it's going to be that, you know, after some other experience. What I'd encourage people considering doing that to do is to recognize that that's a business. And just as if you were going to have a CPA firm, you probably belong to the Washington Society of CPAs and the American Institute of CPAs. Everything about public speaking and everything about running a business of public speaking can, in fact, be learned. It can be enhanced by seeking that out. So for public speaking, classes like yours, Toastmasters and so forth, are absolutely critical and will improve dramatically, dramatically their ability to have an impact on an audience. If it's about business, then the National Speakers Association and probably the professional association of whatever profession they're in as well um, can absolutely enhance their ability to be successful in the business of speaking and getting paid for it. So I would encourage people to continue to seek out the resources that will improve this skill because this skill, it cuts across every different job, every profession. It will enhance your ability to be an effective volunteer, an effective parent 
There is no place that the skills you learn <laughs> for crafting an effective message and delivering it won't help you, even if you don't decide to become a paid professional speaker.